And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two newcomers to the temple. The the two the two the two founding members of the new of the new paladin order and and writers of the t of the tomb of Theragard, the first book in the new paladin order series in the blue in the blue corner we have Char we have Charles C Cromwell and in the red corner we have Kenneth W Cromwell by Cro by Crom we have so many Croms here <laughs> yes how how you two doing today we're doing really well. It's uh, been an exciting day, and it's always good to be uh, have a day off on uh, on a weekend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, definitely. And talking about the book, which is good too. Yeah. Sequel. So, I'd, so I'd like to I'd like to open at the hum, at the humble beginnings. Um, when walk me through when the when the writing bug hit you guys and how that and how that went down. Well, it was a, a rather long process. Um, when uh, when we were children, because uh, uh, we're both brothers, mm -hmm. we played a lot of uh, Dungeons and Dragons and some other uh, fantasy and science fiction kind of role playing games. Mm -hmm. And um, we we're all good students. Uh, none of us were English teachers or anything of that sort, but um, we really enjoyed the genre of fantasy. Did a lot of reading, and uh, we always talked about writing a book. But um, we never took any concrete action towards it. Well, maybe the whole writing process probably took us about seven, eight years, a really long time because things were uh, a learning process for, for us. But um, my brother Ken and I um, sat around and discussed, do we really want to give this a shot? We did some research on how to write a fantasy book. It's one thing to... Uh, uh, read a lot of fantasy. It's another thing to put um, ink down to paper. And, um, you know, we read some good guides on how to write. And uh, we started doing our outline. So, you know, the first uh, first uh, start of that was probably eight years before the book came out in 2019. Mm -hmm. Now, with now with that kind of thing in mind, what what drew you into um, to write about fantasy specifically? Was it just the um, was it just the games that you were that you were growing up playing, or was there a different route? It's a little bit of the games that we we're playing, uh, but it's also uh, if you read our book, it ties a little bit into um, uh, the fact that we both enjoy history, and I myself have done a great deal of overseas traveling. So fantasy puts us in a realm where, you know, if you write about a castle or write about, say, the Antium Empire, we can draw upon our own history lessons, uh, that what we know about Roman history, Greek history, English history, what I've seen out in the field, out in Athens, out in Rome, out in Egypt, and we can draw those experiences together and put those into a book. Um, so it's part, you know, our interest, because I would say probably 90% of the uh, of the kinds of books I would read anywhere from you know the age of, of 11 up to age 40 were uh, fantasy books but it's also part of being able to draw upon uh, real life experiences mm -hmm. now with with that with that kind of thing in mind um, I have to I have to get one dumb question out of my system. Um, between between the two of you, as I often do with the uh, as I often do with these two man projects, which one to use the Abbot? Which one to use the Costello? <laughs> um, I would say um, I would say I would say Ken's Ken's more uh, Abbot, I more Costello. <laughs> You know, when we were kids, too, that was another thing. We loved watching Abbott Costello, The Three Stooges, mm -hmm. um, I Love Lucy, all those shows um, that were no longer really on the air, of course, or movies that were no longer on the air. But uh, 
slapstick kind of things. Those were great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely wanted to put some humor in the book, too. I mean, Tolkien didn't have a lot of humor in his works, but we have a little with Telvar, some of his comments. Yeah, the banter between um, uh, Telvar, who is our wizard, Wolfric, who's like a barbarian kind of a guy, and uh, Kara, who happens to be uh, Wolfric's uh, girlfriend. But the banter between those three get get pretty good, just mm-hmm. in terms of the differences in their personalities, the fact that one's a barbarian, one's um, a wizard, and you always kind of uh, experience those kind of uh, uh, different perspectives. Mm-hmm on uh, how to solve problems. But yeah, we definitely have some comedy in the, in the book. And uh, uh, the readers who have uh, read the book have enjoyed that part of the book as well. Yeah. Now, with, the, with that in mind, you, um, you had, you had descri- you've, descri- you've described the book as, be- as being in the vein of uh, of Lord of the Rings and um, Dragonlance, and obviously, obviously, those are those are major names when it comes to when it, when it comes to cla- when it comes to classical styles of fantasy. But if you, but where would you where would you say that um, New Paladin Order would le- would lean more in that paradigm? Would you say it leans more in Lord of the Rings or more in um, Dragonlance in terms of its storytelling style? I would have to say it's probably more in the Dragonlance style. Mm-hmm. Um, Tolkien was an English professor of history and language and is on a whole nother level than we are. And what he was writing about, uh, if you take a look at The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, and uh, The Silmarillion, he's just on a whole different plateau mm-hmm. on how he developed his universe and his language and the gods and all that. We're striving to achieve something like that. As you read um, the Tomb of Theragard and the next two books that are coming out, um, you'll see we're developing a magic system. We're developing a history. We're developing, um, you know, maps and whatnot to give a lot to broaden our world a little bit more than you see, like, in the uh, TSR Dragonlance books. Mm-hmm. But... Um, the fact that our our stories are more focused around a party of adventurers with a certain set of skills, um, it, it definitely it's closer to the, that kind of uh, story writing. Yeah. Now, when I'd also be remiss if I didn't bring up that you that you had made mention of Conan in the in the pitch, which is interesting because a lot because the other two the other examples, Forgotten Realms, Dragonlance, Lord of the Rings. Are very squarely in the realm of um, high or epic fantasy. There's there's a bit of debate about whether or not Lord of the Rings counts as mythic fantasy, but which is a rabbit hole I don't feel like going down to without a sufficient amount of alcohol. Um, but but the Conan part of it is interesting since Conan is treated more as um, sword and sorcery. The reason I bring these kind of things up is that um, fantasy takes a takes a lot of permutations. Yeah, I would say Chuck is the Tolkien fan. Not that I'm not, <laughs> but I am the hot Robert E. Howard nut. Mm-hmm. So to me, like in the character of Wolfric as a barbarian, uh, his style, his crisp descriptions, action, is what I strive for, mm-hmm. as opposed to Tolkien. That's how it's kind of like a you know merging, if you can, between my interest and Chuck's. Which given yeah, it was not uncommon for us to sit back and ask, you know, in this situation, what would Conan do? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the uh, the differences between Conan and like our writing, uh, Conan's a bit more of a ladies' man than you see going on in our book. And uh, maybe some of the scenes are a little bit more graphic than you see out of our book. Um, our book is something that any mom would be have no issue having their 12-year-old or 13-year-old read. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe some of the stuff out of a Conan book um, you know, might be a little 
on the rough side for a young somebody on the younger side. Mm-hmm. Now, with with that in mind, since given the given the fact that you've got on one hand um, take taking some stylings from um, from Robert E. Howard, on on who um, who was not who did not have kind things to say about the concept of civilization. On the other hand, you have um, you have Tol you have the work of Tolkien, and on one further hand, you have. The you have the um, contributions that um, Mar that Margaret Weiss did with Dr with Dragonlance, and that's three per that's three very particular angles um, of fantasy, and with and with that, I'm curious how you guys um, try try and strike a balance between all three without go without going too far in one direction over another. Well, to give you a feel for at least how I see it, if you look at like a world like Dragonlance mm -hmm. or, or, or that, that's sort of um, a world in which the universe is sort of constant. You have a number of, of, of uh, cities and whatnot, but it's, it's intended as a role-playing universe. And as such, it's sort of constant. Um, uh, where there's good countries, bad countries, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, if you take a look at how um, Tolkien portrays things, you can definitely see um, what I, I feel a very, you know, uh, positive uh, 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 imagery of, of, of mankind. Um, I think Tolkien had a great deal of faith in people, and they had a great deal of religious faith. Um what our book is more intended or the universe is more akin to how you might see uh, the real world. Mm -hmm. um, if you take a look at like, for instance, the Antium Empire, it almost reflects back to um, uh, like a Roman Empire kind of period or a more realistic to Earth kind of uh, universe. Um where you see rise and fall of empires and going into decay. Um, but you generally have a positive sense of, you know, of, of generally people are, are good people. It's not a, um, the universe is bad, all human beings are bad, or anything of that sort. Yeah. Now, with that, with that in mind, the, in the, in the pit, in the pitch, um, We've t we've talked about, obviously the obviously the series is called New Paladin Order. We've talked to, we've talked about barbarians and the like. Um, there's been a, there's been a bit of debate about using using the using these sort of part using these sort of lexicon. May um, in some cases can can have can add a bit of a gamist attitude to uh, to get to the to writing because because those are because those are terms that an audience is going to be familiar with um how how do you how do you how do you manage the expectations that people have of certain class archetypes especially with the popularity of these class archetypes by way of dungeons and dragons well i can no yeah, the, yeah the paladin i guess is the biggest archetype hmm. i always wanted to read a book about a genuine true in my mind religious devout warrior and that was the basis for this mm -hmm. book series and now whether it comports with people's gaming uh, opinions of it I'm not sure I don't know if Chuck has other ideas <laughs> yeah, I would say that the uh, our 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 paladin character definitely has a more of a uh, a devotion to his religion than you would typically see in a fantasy book. In a fantasy book, you might you might be turning undead or something of that sort. Mm -hmm. But in this case, his connection with uh, Aten God is very real, and it's. Not just an archetype pulled out of fantasy, though. It's also an archetype pulled out of 
real knights from the Middle Ages who fought for real, who fought for, at that time, Christianity. Mm -hmm. So knights were a real thing. Knights with religious vows were a real thing. The knights uh, Templar, the knights Hospitaller, excuse my pronunciation, those were real things. So, for instance, in the second book of writing, we get to learn a little bit more about the structure of the paladins, the structure of the knights. And that's based on not so much fantasy, but Middle Ages European history. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a big influence too, at least as far as I in mind, was Alfred Dugan or Duggan historical fiction, where he talks about the Crusades and Roman. It's historical fiction based on real events, but fictionalized of real people. And that was also important. Mm-hmm. Now, at the same time, because we're we are uh, gearing it towards kinds of books we would have liked to read uh, when we were twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, eighteen, twenty-two. Um, there are all the archetypes that you do talk about. There are are uh, wizards in it, and we did go out out of our way to define a uh, evolve a magic system that makes sense, but it isn't like you know, a, a wizard pulling out a a spell book and saying this is a level two spell or a level three spell, but we do give it a realistic magic system. Mm-hmm. And taking that taking that into taking that into account, I will I will um I will note my own exp- my own experience when it comes to when it comes to the issue with paladins, which I'll end up which I'll end up delving into on on my own show down the road when I do the Valley of the Judged. Um, paladins have had a reputation for the longest time as a problem class because there are, because there are certain enforced behaviors that they'd ha- that they'd have to follow over the years. Otherwise, they lose their powers as a paladin. Which uh, the be- the best way to describe it is that while some while some classes ha- while some classes can have their their fair share of dickishness. Um, in some cases, because because of certain things that they that they can't to, that they are not allowed to tolerate, or that they ha, or that they have to go by certain actions. In worst cases, they end up they end up being almost mandated to be a dick. Um, you mean like we were playing, and I was a paladin, and people like loot corpses? Should we do that? <laughs> um, stuff stuff like debate. that. <laughs> stuff like that. That it's. It's one of those things that really va- that really varies depending on which edition you're ta- you're talking about. Some of them have been more str- have been more strident about this issue than others, but it has been present for years. Um, in s- in some cases, the idea of of to- of torture of torturing an- a captured enemy to try and get information is not is not allowable because paladins can't stand by with with any kind of torture, in- even if it's f- no matter. Reg- no matter what the context is, uh, or or um, or the or the awkwardness if it if you have a if you have a setup where the party has has cer- has certain types of spellcasters that they are not that they are supposed to be opposed to, even if that's once again regardless of context, um, that's the kind of thing that's given them the reputation of a problem class over the years. Yeah, I understand what you're saying in terms of a Dungeons and Dragons concept, but in our particular book, um, those kind of those kind of moral dilemmas they generally don't occur. Uh, there are there are occasions though where, uh, and it's not so much him being a paladin; it's a, him his belief in his belief in God mm-hmm. is is when to judge. Uh, how to when did when is the right time to lift the sword and take a life? Mm-hmm. That kind of moral dilemma does come up in the in the uh, first book. Um, Tryon goes out and has to uh, defend um, some feeble monks, and in the course of defending them, he kills two um, or I believe it was two two um, barbarians that were attacking the party, and he feels a great moral dilemma you know he took somebody's life when he had previously given you know um a vow of of, of peace and that's a moral dilemma that he has 
steps to overcome understanding you know what is you know a just taking of a life just as the church has decided you know what is a just war um things of that sort mm -hmm. so it's not so much within the party because the party is generally um behaving in a fairly moral sense but it, it he does have uh moral situations where he would more likely sacrifice his own needs or desires for those of others but no he doesn't come out you know as a like in dungeon dragon stopping the thief from pickpocketing uh somebody's key so they can get out of prison or something like that 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 kind of a thing doesn't happen yeah now with that with that in mind you did you did mention earlier about set about setting up a setting up a magic system that's going to work within your particular setting um what can you tell what can you tell me about that because Magic systems can take a what can take a wide amount of variance. Well, I think the the most important thing, uh, one of the flaws I see in a lot of books, in a lot of magic systems, is that it's very open ended on what any magic user could do, uh, any wizard can do. So you might be. In any situation, the wizard can do this and do that and always get him out of a situation, and it just doesn't make sense. So the first thing we needed to do is make sure that their powers are very limited, right? So in our particular uh, book, uh, we, the, the wizards draw their power from the astral plane, mm -hmm. and their ability to draw that power, um, how much power they can draw... Uh, is reflective on what, how far advanced within the wizard guild they are. Are they a red mage, orange mage, yellow mage? You know, like in the spectrum of colors. Mm -hmm. um, and they can also store a little bit of that magic um, within a gem that they that they can have, like the, like a wand, so they can store some of that power. But there's a limit, and once they've used that limit, that's it. And they also have specialties, like our main character Talvar. He's uh, he's special in elemental magic like fire water air mm -hmm. um so uh, uh, normally under normal circumstances he's not going to be say um and we don't really do this in the book but teleporting somebody from this place to this place he's good at one particular branch of magic and once he's released all of his energy for the day you know he has to draw more power he has to rest so it's, it's um the wizards there are very, you know, they have a limited amount of power. Um, it's akin to like a Dungeon Dragons kind of thing where you have to read a spell book and rest and rejuvenate your power. But not yeah, the in case they're drawing stuff. it from the <laughs> astral plane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Which, which I can de I can definitely I can definitely see that. Now the interesting thing when you brought when you brought up the the spell set up in in D and D is because is that being that being rooted in the dying earth model f from J from Jack Vance's books and especially the whole thing of having to memorize some um, spells um but uh, but uh, but how do you uh, but is it through is it through just in, is it through just endurance and resting that you maintain that sim that similar level of control without the whole um memorization and forget and forgetting spells a la um, Dying Earth? I would say there is, um, like in Dungeons and Dragons, you have to memorize a spell and then it comes out of your head. Mm -hmm. In ours, it's more along the lines of, and I find it a more realistic system. You, uh, if you're a wizard and you have, you will have a spell book and there are spells that you will learn in them. Um, but those spells help you manipulate energy. And once you've learned them, you're always going to memorize them. You're, you're going to know them. It's just a matter of whether or not you have the power within you, the power within your wand that you've stored some of your energy in um, to cast that particular spell. Now, you might uh, want to learn to do something different. Say you've specialized in um, elemental magic, but you want to, say, for instance, perform an illusion so, you, uh, so your hair looks blue instead of black. Well... You might be able to do that with some training and memorizing the hand uh, gestures and whatnot, but um, 
Yeah, it's a matter of resting, pulling power from the astral plane. Um, and there are also, um, in our book, there's also wizard towers, which um, are scarce and becoming fewer every year because nobody knows how to make them anymore. But those draw power as well, but on a much higher level. And of course, you're not walking around with a wizard tower with a big, much bigger gem atop of it. <laughs> yeah, I would also say our spells are like mathematics. Think of it as like a mathematical formula you have to create before you can make a new spell. Mm -hmm. It's real complex with how you manipulate the energy and your voice and your hand and what reagents you need. It's, it's like a formula, a mathematical formula. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in with that in mind, um. The way you have the way you have it the way you have it described, in the in the in the um in the Amazon page as well as on your own website, um, almost ha almost has the almost has the paladins described as the as this as this let as this legend of a of ages past, but there aren't any any paladins existing now. Is that is that the case? It's they're a dying order, is what it is, and they're fewer and fewer. They're getting older and older. Their powers are waning and waning, and at the time, the world is getting more dangerous, and hence, eventually, a new paladin order will form to meet these dangers. But right now, there are some we'll see in book two, but the order is diminished. And there, I guess they thought the need for them was going away, but they still exist. They're just so few, though, that some people probably would say they're more like legends. Mm -hmm. Legends, old wives' tale, whichever, whichever you prefer. Yes. Now, with that, with that in with that in mind, um, when it comes to, when it comes to this book, when it comes to this book series. Was it a, was it a case where you had where you guys had initially planned to write just one book and then and then that was it or did you guys always plan for it to be a full series? We have always planned for a, a, a full series. We do have um, obviously the the next two books which will be coming out together. Um, those were planned, and we have an end game for the series in mind as well. We don't know how many books it takes to get from the beginning to the end. We don't know how many years it'll take for us to get from the beginning to the end, but we definitely always had uh, a series in mind, a series of books in mind. Mm -hmm. And it was just a matter of when we came out with the first book, see what kind of reception we had, uh, what kind of, just how professional, how well received was the book to uh, see if we're going to be able to actually continue on. And we've been really happy with how well received the book is from our target audience. You take a look at like Amazon reviews, um, and we can see the people who are interested in that kind of book really do like the book. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why we have continued on to uh, uh, put out the next two books when those are complete. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, what would you say ha you would be some of the learning experiences that you've had? in the in the creation and release of the first book well i would say in the creation of the first book of course keep in mind we're not full-time authors mm -hmm. um i'm an engineer ken works in finance so everything is done part-time and we put together a system now of writing uh editing reviewing writing chapters so the Mechanical aspects of writing the book are a lot more uh, well developed now. Um, starting out with writing, you know, coming up with the idea for the book, writing uh, all the scene outlines, filling in the scenes. Then my brother Ken, he does all the bulk work of the writing. Then we'll sit down and um, I'll read it, edit it, and then we'll sit down together and actually read it out loud and edit it again and then read it out loud and then edit it again and then at the end of the day we'll we, we actually have a we have a pro 
professional a- editor mm-hmm. um, that reads the book, that reads the book and does all the final editing for us. Um, Alan, uh, Alan Edmonds that uh, does the editing for us. So I would say the creation of the book has gone a long way to getting done more quickly from book one to the next two. Mm-hmm. And we've also had lessons on marketing a little bit. Um, we The first cover of the book that we put out was a beautiful cover, but it was more geared towards um, like a history book look to it, even though it had a golem on it. Uh, so then we said, well, we really want to market this book. So we had somebody else put out a new cover that makes it look more like, okay, this is a fantasy book. And uh, lastly, we... Uh, you know, all people are reading less and listening more. So, um, just a few months ago, we came out with the audiobook version, and people really like audiobooks these days. So, I wish we had gone and put the audiobook out uh, concurrent with the first book, where we just had no idea that was that big a thing. And with, but with that, with that in mind, um. How, f- how um, what are you get? What are you guys shooting for as far as a release window for your second book? Well, we're shooting, uh, we're shooting for right now. We're we're shooting for maybe May or June of 2022, and it'll actually be books two and three. Um, quite frankly, we we were intending it just to be book two. But our books tend to be long, and we found out how long it was, and we realized, oh, we're going to have to crack this in half. So we found an appropriate place to crack it in half. So May May or June, um, a summer release for books two and three, they should come out together. They're uh, a couple months away from going to our editor. Book uh, Covers have already uh, been created, and uh, we already know who's going to be the same person, um, uh, Steve Fortune, is going to be doing our uh, audio version of that when it's done. Like, and I'll I'll certainly be keeping a close eye on how th- on how that develops, especially especially since the I'd say the world ne- the world can always use more paladins, especially get especially given how it's a good way to balance out the reputation that the paladin archetype has had over the years. And it's yeah, we... it's a really uh, it's a good book for uh, it it's it's a very good traditional book if someone would have read in the 40s or 50s or 60s um where you'd be more than happy to have any of your kids reading it. There's nothing um you know, it has positive role models for everybody in it, I would mm-hmm. say. Without, you know, that being a big goal of the book, but it's definitely something you could hand to your child when the reading level hits that and not worry about it. Mm-hmm. But with but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to all the way up to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Well, thank you very much for having us. It was a pleasure. We just love talk- talking about our book. Mm-hmm. And I yes, thank you. It was uh, fun for our first time. You were nice and uh, gentle with us. <laughs> Phrasing. <laughs> and of course, anytime you guys see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thank you very much, and uh, enjoy your day. Mm-hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gimming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!